Hello students, this is Ms. Skoken. We're back in chapter nine for the final section of our chapter about significance testing. And this time we're talking about testing about a population mean. We have several learning objectives. These parallel the ones from section two, state and check the conditions for inference, perform an inference test about a population mean. And remember that's talking about our state plan do conclude full format. Use a confidence interval to draw a conclusion for a two-sided test about a population parameter. In section 9.2, we talked about that connection between the confidence interval and the two-sided hypothesis testing with probability in both tails. Last of all, perform a significance test about a mean difference using paired data. If you remember back in chapter four, we started learning about matched pair design. This is an application of that information. So we're gonna see what a significance test looks like when we're finding a difference. This is also going to be a great lead in to our chapter 10, where we are going to be always comparing two different groups or two different populations, which is different than a paired test. A quick recap about how we got here. Remember that confidence intervals and significance tests for a population proportion P are based on Z values, and we use the standard normal distribution and the Z test statistic. But when we're talking about inference about a population mean, we're going to be using a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom, except in those very rare instances when we actually have the population standard deviation sigma. Now we learned how to construct a confidence interval for a population mean back in section 8.3. Now that we're in section 9.3, we're going to see how to test a claim for population mean. You rem may remember an example about batteries, AAA batteries. The company claims that the new AAA battery lasts longer than traditional AAA batteries. Based on years of experience, the company knows that its previous AAA battery design lasted for three, 30 hours of continuous use. This is again, a long-term average of their previous AAA batteries. We take a simple random sample of size 15 of the new batteries and we found that in that sample, we had a mean life of 33.9 hours and a standard deviation of 9.8 hours. Question is, do these data give convincing evidence that the new batteries last longer on average than the previous battery design? In order to answer that research question, we're gonna run a significance test. Our null hypothesis will be the population mean is 30 hours, which is the previous battery design life, and our alternative hypothesis is gonna be on that right-hand side direction where the population mean is greater than 30 hours because they think the new battery is better. And then we explain what our symbol mu is standing for, the true mean lifetime of the new AAA batteries. We cannot proceed without checking conditions. So in our plan, we're gonna be checking conditions if conditions for inference are met, dot, dot, dot. Remember that random comes from either a well-designed random sample for a, an observational study or a randomized experiment. Our 10% rule is what allows us to use our standard deviation formula and our large sample, large counts or normal, however you wanna call it, is going to be giving us the shape of our sampling distribution. The central limit theorem may apply if our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, or if we already know that the population is a normal distribution, we can proceed with a normal assumption, or we're gonna to have to graph our sample data. Do not use T procedures if the graph shows strong skewness or outliers. Once conditions are met, we can proceed. When running significance testing, we're always gonna assume that the null hypothesis is true, and we're trying to collect evidence from our sample that proves the null hypothesis is not true. So we're gonna come up with a test statistic and in this case, because our test statistic is going to be based on the t-distribution, we're not going to call it our z-test statistic. It's going to be our t-test statistic. Formula is going to be the same, though, statistic minus parameter divided by standard deviation of the statistic. We're testing about a population mean, so our test statistic is going to be based on the sample mean. Remember that the standard deviation is going to be slightly different. It's gonna be our standard error because we don't actually know the population standard deviation. So we're going to use the sample standard deviation. And we're going to be using a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. 
Back to the battery example. The battery company wants to test the null hypothesis mu is equal to 30 versus the alternative hypothesis population mean is greater than 30. The simple random sample is going to be based on 15 of the new battery design and they're going to drain the battery completely to see the mean lifetime of the 15 batteries in the simple random sample. We have a standard deviation and a mean lifetime for our sample given here. We're going to calculate the test statistic by plugging everything in, our sample value, our null hypothesis value, our sample standard deviation, and our sample size. In this case, we get a positive 1.54 T test statistic. This is going to allow us to calculate that right-hand probability either through TCDF or through using table B. In either case, we're going to be using N minus 1 or 14 degrees of freedom. And we want to come up with our p-value. We see that our, our t test statistic is somewhere between, this is on table B now, somewhere between 1.345 and 1.761 because we have a value of 1.54. And if you scroll or scan upward, you see that that is giving an upper tail probability P of between 0.10 and 0.05, so between 5 and 10%. So the P value for this test is somewhere between 0.05 and 0.10. Now, obviously, we can also use TCDF for this to get a more accurate probability. But what really matters is that we are above our alpha of what is probably 0.05, and that is going to allow us to make a conclusion about rejecting or fail to reject, even if we don't have an exact probability. If we are going to use table B, just a reminder that not every single value is there. So if we have a degree of freedom that is not actually on our table B, what we're going to need to do is use the conservative or the smaller value to calculate our test statistic. You may remember back in table A we had both a negative page and a positive page depending on which side of the mean we were on, the center of the distribution, but in table B we only have positive values. We do know that there is symmetry however, so if we come up with a negative value for our test statistic we can use the positive value and knowing that there's symmetry to find our p-value. If conditions for inference are met, we are going to conduct a one-sample t-test for mean. Our test statistic is going to be calculated using this formula, and we're going to calculate our p-value based on our test statistic t result. That's going to give us either a right-hand probability for a greater than, a left-hand probability for a less than, or a two-sided probability for a not equal to. Remember that there's a strong connection between a two-sided hypothesis or significance test and confidence interval. For means, both of these inference methods use the standard error of the sample mean in the calculations. So here we have the formula for our t-test statistic and our format for our confidence interval based on the t-distribution. And we know that there is a strong connection that 95%, for example, corresponds to an alpha of 0.05. Remember that idea that if we create the confidence interval, all the range of plausible values are going to be in the fail to reject area. Outside that, that confidence interval in those tail areas, that's what we're going to call our reject area. And that's where if we get a probability in one of those tail areas, we're going to reject the null hypothesis in our significance test. When the two-sided significance test at our significance level of alpha fails to reject the null hypothesis, that means that the confidence interval is going to contain or capture or include our null hypothesis value for mean, the claim value. Let's talk about paired data. We know that single sample studies are less common out there in the world than comparative inference. So if you remember back in chapter four, we learned about a match pair design where either the two observations were made on the same individual with different treatments or on very similar individuals. And this results in what we call paired data. 
we're going to look at a specific type of inference design for this paired data. When paired data result from measuring the same quantitative variable twice, as an example of job satisfaction, asking the same individual the survey information, we can make comparisons by analyzing the differences in each pair. If conditions for inference are met, as always, we can use a one-sample T procedure to perform inference about the mean difference. So we're going to, again, be looking at the difference between the data. These methods are called paired T procedures. Let's take a look at a very relatable example. Paired data and one-sample T procedures. Researchers designed an experiment to study the effects of caffeine withdrawal. They recruited 11 volunteers who were diagnosed as being caffeine dependent to serve as subjects. Each subject was barred from cola, coffee, and other substances with caffeine for the duration of the experiment. During one two-day period, subjects took capsules containing their normal caffeine intake. During another two-day period, they took placebo capsules. The order in which the subjects took caffeine and the placebo was randomized. At the end of each two-day period, a test for depression was given to all 11 subjects. Researchers wanted to know if being deprived of caffeine would lead to an increase in depression. We see in the table the results of the study. Each subject is numbered 1 through 11. They rate their depression when they take the caffeine tablets and they rate their depression after taking the placebo capsules. And then for each individual in the study, we find the difference, placebo minus caffeine. Note that in the difference column, we have both positive and negative values indicate whether there was more depression with the placebo with a positive number or more depression with caffeine giving us a negative number. We're going to need a little bit more time than we have in this video to continue on and do the significance test for this data. So I'm going to stop it here and create a part two of our section 9.3. So I'll see you back in part two.